Chapter 5 of The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus Translated by Arthur S. Way Born 13 February 1847 Died 25 December 1930 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. So when all other contests had an end, Thetis the goddess laid down in the midst great souled Achilles' arms, divinely wrought, and all around flashed out the cunning work wherewith the fire god overchased the shield, fashioned for Aeacus' son the dauntless souls. Inwrought upon that labor of a god were first high heaven and cloudland, and beneath lay earth and sea. The winds, the clouds were there, the moon and sun, each in its several place. There, too, were all the stars that, fixed in heaven, are born in its eternal circlings round. Above and through all was the infinite air, Where to and fro flit birds of slender beak. Thou hadst said they lived, and floated on the breeze. Here Tethys all embracing arms were wrought, And ocean's fathomless flow, The outrushing flood of rivers crying to the echoing hills all round, To right, to left, rolled o'er the land. Round it rose league-long mountain ridges, Haunts of terrible lions and foul jackals, there fierce bears and panthers prowled with these were seen wild boars that whetted deadly clashing tusks in grimly frothing jaws there hunters sped after the hounds beaters with stone and dart to the life portrayed toiled in the woodland sport and there were man-devouring wars and all the horrors of fight slain men were falling down mid horse hooves and the likeness of the plain blood drenched was on that shield invincible Panic was there, and dread, and ghastly Eno, with limbs all gore besplattered, hideously, and deadly strife, and the avenging spirits fierce-hearted. She, still goading warriors on to the onset, they, outbreathing breath of fire, around them hovered the relentless fates, beside them battle incarnate onward pressed, yelling, and from their limbs streamed blood and sweat. There were the ruthless gorgons, through their hair horrible serpents coiled with flickering tongues. A measureless marvel was that cunning work of things that made men shudder to behold, seeming as though they verily lived and moved. And while here all war's marvels were portrayed, yonder all the works of lovely peace. The myriad tribes of much-enduring men dwelt in fair cities, Justice watched o'er all. To diverse toils they set their hands. The fields were harvest-laden. Earth her increase bore. Most steeply rose on that god-labored work The rugged flanks of holy honors mount. And there upon a palm-tree throned she sat, Exalted, and her hands reached up to heaven. All round her paths broken by many rocks Thwarted the climber's feet. By those steep tracks daunted ye saw returning many folk, Few won by sweat of toil the sacred height. And there were reapers, moving down long swaths, Swinging the wetted sickles. Neath their hands the hot work sped to its close. Hard after these many sheaf-binders followed, And the work grew passing great. With yoke bands on their necks oxen were there, Whereof some drew the wains heaped high with foliage sheaves and further on were others ploughing, and the gelb showed black behind them. Youths with ever-busy goads followed, a world of toil was there portrayed. And there a banquet was, with pipe and harp, dances of maids, and flashing feet of boys, all in swift movement, like to living souls. Hard by the dance and its sweet winsomeness out of the sea was rising lovely crowned Cyprus, Foam blossoms still upon her hair, And round her hovered, Smiling witchingly, Desire, And danced the graces lovely tressed. And there were lordly Neris daughters shown, Leading their sister up from the wide sea To her espousals with the warrior king. And round her all the immortals Banqueted on Pelion's ridge far-stretching, All about lush dewy water-meads there were, Bestarred with flowers innumerable, Grassy groves, and springs with clear transparent water bright. There 
their ships with sighing sheets swept o'er the sea some beating up to windward some that sped before a following wind and round them heaved the melancholy surge seared shipmen rushed this way and that a dreadful tempest gust hauling the white sails in to scape the death it all seemed real some tugging at the oars while the dark sea on either side the ship grew hoary neath the swiftly plashing blades and there triumphant the earth shaker rode amid sea monsters stormy footed steeds drew him and seemed alive as o'er the deep they raced off smitten by the golden whip around their path of flight the waves fell smooth and all before them was unrippled calm dolphins on either hand about their king swarmed in wild rapture of homage bowing backs and seemed like live things o'er the hazy sea swimming albeit of silver wrought marvels of untold craft were imaged there by cunning souled hephaestus deathless hands upon the shield an ocean's fathomless flood clasped like a garland all the outer rim and compassed all the strong shield's curious work and there beside the massy helm lay Zeus in his wrath was set upon the crest, thrown in on heaven's dome. The immortals all around, fierce battling with the titans, fought for Zeus. Already were their foes enwrapped with flame, for thick and fast as snowflakes poured from heaven the thunderbolts. The might of Zeus was roused, and burning giants seemed to breathe out flames. And there beside the fair strong corslet lay, unpierceable, which clasped Pleiades once. There were the greaves close lapping, light alone to Achilles, massy of mould and huge they were and hard by flashed the sword whose edge and point no mail could turn with golden belt and sheath of silver and with haft of ivory brightest among those wondrous arms it shone stretched on the earth thereby was that dread spear long as the tall tressed pines of peleon still breathing out the reek of hector's blood then mid the argives thetis sable stoled in her deep sorrow for achilles spake now all the athlete prizes have been won which i set forth in sorrow for my child now let that mightiest of argives come who rescued from the foe my dead to him these glorious immortal arms i give which even the blessed deathless joyed to see then rose in rivalry each claiming them Laertes' seed and godlike Telamon's son, Aeas, the mightiest far of Danian men. He seemed the star that in the glittering sky outshines the host of heaven. Hesperus, so splendid by Pleiades' arms he stood. And let these judge, he cried, Idomeneus, Nestor, and kingly counseled Agamemnon. For these he weened would surelyest know the truth of deeds wrought in that glorious battle toil. To these I also trust most utterly, Odysseus said, for prudent of their wit be these, and princeliest of all Danian men. But to Idomeneus and Atreus' son spake Nestor apart, and willingly they heard, Friends, a great woe and unendurable this day the careless gods have laid on us, in that into this lamentable strife Aeas the mighty hath been thrust by them against Odysseus passing wise, for he to whitsoe'er god gives the victor's glory oh yea he shall rejoice but he that loseth all for the grief in all the danians hearts for him and ours shall be the deepest grief of all for that man will not in the war stand by us as of old and a sorrowful day it shall be for us whitsoe'er of these shall break into fierce anger seeing they are of our heroes chiefest this in war and that in council hearken then to me seeing i am older far than ye not by a few years only with mine age is prudence join for i have suffered and wrought much and in counsel ever the old man who knoweth much excelleth younger men therefore let us ordain to judge this cause twixt godlike aeas and warfane odysseus our trojan captives they shall say who most our foes dread and who save pleiades course from that most deadly fight lo in our midst be many spear-won Trojans, thralls of faith, and these will pass true judgment on these twain, to neither showing favor, since they hate alike all authors of their misery. 
he spake replied agamemnon lord of spears ancient there is none other in our midst wiser than thou of danians young or old in that thou sayest the unforgiving wrath will burn in him to whom the gods herein deny the victory for these which strive are both our chiefest therefore mine heart too is set on this that to the thralls of war this judgment we commit the loser then shall against troy devise his deadly work of vengeance and shall not be wroth with us he spake and these three being of one mind in hearing of all men refused to judge judgment so thankless they would none of it therefore they set the high-born sons of troy there in the midst spear thralls although they were to give just judgment in the warrior's strife then in hot anger aias rose and spake odysseus frantic soul why hath a god deluded thee to make thee hold thyself my peer in might invincible darest thou say that thou when slain achilles lay in dust when round him swarmed the trojans didst bear back that furious throng when i amidst them hurled death and thou cowardest away thy dam bear thee a craven and a weakling wretch frail in comparison of me as is a cur beside a lion thunder-voiced no battle-biding heart is in thy breast but wiles and treachery be all thy care thou hast forgotten how thou didst shrink back from faring with achaea's gathered host to ilium's holy burg till atreus sons forced thee the cowering craven how loath soe'er to follow them would god thou hadst never come for by thy counsel we left in lemnos isle groaning in agony peoeus son renowned not for him alone was ruin devised of thee for godlike palamedes too didst thou contrive destruction ha he was alike in battle and counsel better than thou and now thou darest rise up against me neither remembering my kindness nor having respect unto the mightier man who rescued thee erewhile when thou didst quaff in fight before the onset of thy foes when thou forsaken of all greeks beside midst tumult of the fray was fleeing too oh that in that great fight zeus self had stayed my dauntless might with thunder from his heaven then with their two-edged swords the trojan men had hewn thee limb from limb and to their dogs had cast thy carrion then thou hadst not presumed to meet me trusting in thy trickeries wretch wherefore if thou vauntest thee in might beyond all others hast thou set thy ships in the line's centre screened from foes nor dared as i on the far wing to draw them up because thou wast afraid not thou it was who savest from devouring fire the ships but i with heart unquelling there stood fast facing the fire and hector i even he gave back before me everywhere in fight thou thou didst fear him i with deadly fear oh had this our contention been but set amidst that very battle when the roar of conflict rose around achilles slain then had thine own eyes seen me bearing forth out from the battle's heart and fury of foes that goodly armour and its hero lord unto the tents but here thou canst but trust in cunning speech and covetest the place among the mighty thou thou hast not strength to wear achilles arms invincible nor sway his massy spear in thy weak hands but i they are verily moulded to my frame yea seemly it is i wear those glorious arms who shall not shame a god's gift passing fair but wherefore for achilles glorious arms with words this courteous wrangling stand we here come let us try in strife with brazen spears who of us train is best in murderous right for silver-footed fetish set in the midst this prize for prowess not for pestilent words in folk mode may men have use for words in pride of prowess i know me above thee far and great achilles lineage is mine own he spake with scornful glance and bitter speech odysseus the resourceful chode with him aias unbridled tongue 
Apply these vain words to me. Thou hast called me pestilent, nittering, and weakling, yet I boast me better far than thou in wit and speech, which things increase the strength of men. Lo, how the craggy rock, adamantine though it seem, the hewers of stone amid the hills by wisdom undermine full lightly, and by wisdom shipmen cross the thunderous plunging sea when mountain high it surgeth, and by craft do hunters quell strong lions, panthers, boars, yea, all the brood of wild things. Furious-hearted bulls are tamed to bear the yoke bands by device of men. Yea, all things are by wit accomplished. Still it is the man who knoweth that excels the witless man, alike in toils and counsels. For my keen wit did Aeonius' valiant son choose me of all men with him to draw nigh to Hector's watchmen. Yea, and mighty deeds we twain accomplished. I it was who brought to Atreus' sons Pleiades, far renowned, their battle-helper. Whensoe'er the host needed some other champion, not for the sake of thine hands will he come, nor by the reed of other Argives. Of Achaeans I alone will draw him with soft, suasive words to where strong men are warring. Mighty power the tongue hath over men when courtesy inspires it. Valor is a deedless thing, and bulk and big assemblage of a man cometh to naught by wisdom unattended. But unto me the immortals gave both strength and wisdom, and unto the Argive host made me a blessing. Nor, as thou hast said, hast thou in time past saved me when in flight from foes. I never fled, but steadfastly withstood the charge of all the Trojan host. Furious the enemy came on like a flood, but I by might of hands cut short the thread of many lives. Herein thou sayest not true, me in the fray thou didst not shield nor save, but for thine own life roughest, lest thy spear should pierce thy back if thou shouldst turn and flee from war. My ships, I drew them up midline, not dreading the battle fury of any foe, but to bring healing unto Atreus' sons of war's calamities. And thou didst set far from their help thy ships. Nay more, I seemed with cruel stripes my body, and entered so the Trojans' burg, that I might learn of them all their devisings for this troublous war. Nor ever I dreaded Hector's spear. Myself rose mid the foremost, eager for the fight, when, prowess confident, he defied us all. Yea, in the fight round Achilles, I slew foes far more than thou. T'was I who saved the dead king with this armor. Not a whit I dread thy spear now, but my grievous hurt with pain still vexeth me. The wound I gat in fighting for these arms and their slain lord. In me, as in Achilles, is Zeus' blood. He spake. Strong Aias answered him again. Most cunning and most pestilent of men. Nor I, nor any other Argive saw thee toiling in that fray, when Trojans strove fiercely to hail away Achilles slain. My might it was that with the spear unstrung the knees of some in fight, and others thrilled with panic as they pressed on ceaselessly. Then fled they in dire straits, as geese or cranes flee from an eagle, swooping as they feed along a grassy meadow. So in dread the Trojans, shrinking back from my spear and lightning sword, fled into Ilium to scape destruction. If thy might came there ever at all, not anywhere nigh me, with foes thou foughtest, somewhere far aloof, mid other ranks thou toiledest, nowhere nigh Achilles, where one great battle raged. He spake, replied Odysseus the shrewd heart, Aias, I hold myself no worse than thou in wit or might, how goodly an outward show thou be so e'er. Nay, I am keener far in wit than thou in all the Argive eyes. In battle prowess do I equal thee, haply surpass. And this the Trojans know, who tremble when they see me from afar. I, thou too knowest, and others know my strength by that hard struggle in the wrestling match 
when Peleus' son set glorious prizes forth beside the barrow of Patroclus slain. So spake Laertes' son, the world-renowned. Then on that strife disastrous of the strong, the sons of Troy gave judgment. Victory and those immortal arms awarded they, with one consent, to Odysseus, mighty in war. Greatly his soul rejoiced, but one deep groan brake from the Greeks. Then Aias' noble might stood frozen stiff, and suddenly fell on him dark wilderment. All blood within his frame boiled, and his gall swelled, bursting forth in flood. Against his liver heaved his bowels, his heart with anguished pangs was thrilled. Fierce stabbing throes shot through the filmy veil twixt bone and brain, and darkness and confusion wrapped his mind. With fixed eyes staring on the ground he stood, still as a statue. Then his sorrowing friends closed round him, led him to the shapely ships, ay, murmuring consolations. But his feet trod for the last time with reluctant steps that path, and hard behind him followed doom. When to the ships beside the boundless sea the Argives, faint for supper and for sleep, had passed, into the great deep Thetis plunged, and all the Nereids with her. Round them swam sea monsters many, children of the brine. Against the wise Prometheus bitter wroth the sea maids were, remembering how that Zeus, moved by his prophecies, unto Peleus gave Thetis to wife, a most unwilling bride. Then cried in wrath to thee Simothoe, Oh, that the pestilent prophet had endured all pangs he merited! When deep burrowing, the eagle tear his liver I renewed. So to the dark-haired sea maids cried the nymph. Then sank the sun. The onrush of the night shadowed the fields. The heavens were star-bestrewn. And by the long prowed ships the Argives slept. By ambrosial sleep are mastered, and by wine. The which from proud Idomeneus' realm of Crete the shipmen bear o'er foaming leagues of sea. But Aeas, wroth against the Argive men, would none of meat or drink, nor clasped round him the arms of sleep. In fury he donned his mail, he clutched his sword, thinking unspeakable thoughts. For now he thought to set the ships aflame, and slaughter all the Argives, now to hew with sudden onslaught of his terrible sword guileful odysseus limb from limb such things he purposed nay had soon accomplished all had pallas not with madness smitten him for over odysseus strong to endure her heart yearned as she called to mind the sacrifices offered to her of him continually Therefore she turned aside from Argive men the might of Aeas. As a terrible storm, whose wings are laden with dread hurricane blast, cometh with portents of heart-numbing fear to shipmen, when the Pleiades, fleeing a dread from glorious Orion, plunge beneath the stream of tireless ocean, where the air is turmoil and the sea is mad with storm. So rushed he, whithersoe'er his feet might bear, this way and that he ran, like some fierce beast which darteth down a rock-walled glen's ravines with foaming jaws, and murderous intent against the hounds and huntsmen who have torn out of the cave her cubs and slain. She runs this way and that, and roars, if mid the brakes haply she may see the dear ones lost. Whom, if a man meet in that maddened mood, straightway his darkest of all days hath dawned. So ruthless raving rushed he, blackly boiled his heart, as cauldron on the fire god's hearth maddens with ceaseless hissing, or the flames from the blazing billets coiling round its sides, at bidding of the toiler, eager soul to singe the bristles of a huge fed boar. So was his great heart boiling in his breast, like a wild sea he raved, like tempest blast 
like the winged might of tireless flame amidst the mountains maddened by a mighty wind when the wide blazing forest crumbles down in fervent heat so aias his fierce heart with agony stabbed in maddened misery raved foam frothed about his lips a beast-like roar howled from his throat about his shoulders clashed his armour they which saw him trembled all cowed by the fearful shout of that one man from ocean then uprose dawn golden rain like a soft wind upfloated sleep to heaven and there met hera even then returned to olympus back from thetis unto whom but yester morn she went and sleep swiftly flew to Pasithea's couch from slumber woke all nations of the earth but aias like orion the invincible prowled on still bearing murderous madness in his heart he rushed upon the sheep like lion fierce whose savage heart is stung with hunger pangs here there he smote them laid them dead in dust thick as the leaves which the strong north wind's might strews when the waning year to winter turns so on the sheep in fury aias fell deeming he dealt to danian's evil doom then to his brother menelaus came and spake not in the hearing of the rest this day shall surely be a ruinous day for all since aias thus is sense distraught it may be he will set the ships aflame and slay us all amidst our tents in wrath for those lost arms would god that thetis ne'er had set them for the prize of rivalry would god laertes son had not presumed in folly of soul to strive with a better man fools were we all for some malignant god beguiled us for the one great war defence left us since aeacus son in battle fell was aeas mighty strength and now the gods will to our loss destroy him bringing bane on thee and me that all we may fill up the cup of doom and pass to nothingness he spake replied agamemnon lord of spears now nay menelaus though thine heart he wrung be thou not wroth with the resourceful king of the cephalenian folk but with the gods who plot our ruin blame not him who oft hath been our blessing and our enemy's curse so heavy-hearted spake the danian king but by the streams of xanthos far away neath tamarisk shepherds cowered to hide from death as when from a swift eagle cower hares neath tangled copses when with sharp fierce scream this way and that with wings wide shadowing he wheeleth very nigh so they here there quell from the presence of that furious man at last above a slaughtered ram he stood and with deadly laugh he cried to it lie in the dust be meat for dogs and kites achilles glorious arms have saved not thee for which thy folly strove with a better man lie there thou cur no wife shall fall on thee and clasp and wail thee and her fatherless child nor shalt thou greet thy parents longing eyes the staff of their old age far from thy land thy carrion dogs and vultures shall devour so cried he thinking that amidst the slain odysseus lay blood bolted at his feet but in that moment from his mind and eyes athena tore away the nightmare fiend of madness habit breathing and it passed thence swiftly to the rock wall river styx where dwell the winged Irenaeus they which still visit with torments overweening men then aeas saw those sheep upon the earth gasping in death and sore amazed he stood for he divined that by the blessed ones his senses had been cheated all his limbs failed under him his soul was anguish thrilled he could not in his horror take one step forward or backward like some towering rock fast rooted mid the mountains there he stood but when the wild rout of his thoughts had rallied 
he groaned in misery and in anguish wailed ah me why do the gods abhor me so they have wrecked my mind have with fell madness filled making me slaughter all these innocent sheep would god that on odysseus pestilent heart mine hands had so avenged me miscreant he brought on me a fell curse oh may his soul suffer all the torments that the avenging fiends devise for villains on all other greeks may they bring murderous battle woeful griefs and chiefly on agamemnon atreus son not scatheless to home may he return so long desired but why should i consort i a brave man with the abominable perish the argive host perish my life now unendurable the brave no more hath his due guerdon but the baser sort are honoured most and loved as this odysseus hath worshipped mid the greeks but utterly have they forgotten me and all my deeds all that i wrought and suffered in their cause so spake the brave son of strong telamon then thrust the sword of hector through his throat forth rushed the blood in torrent in the dust outstretched he lay like typhon when the bolts of zeus had blasted him around him groaned the dark earth as he fell upon her breast then thronging came the danians when they saw low laid in the dust the hero but ere then none dared draw nigh him but in deadly fear they watched him from afar now hastened they and flung themselves upon the dead outstretched upon their faces on their heads they cast dust and their wailing went up to the sky as when men drive away the tender lambs out of the fleecy flock to feast thereon and round the desolate pen the mothers leap ceaselessly bleating so our aeas rang that day a very great and bitter cry wild echoes pealed from ida forest palled and from the plain the ships the boundless sea then terser clasping him was minded too to rush on bitter doom howbeit the rest held from the sword his hand anguished he fell upon the dead outpouring many a tear more comfortless than the orphan babe that wails beside the hearth with ashes strewn on head and shoulders wails bereavement's day that brings death to the mother who hath nursed the fatherless child so wailed he ever wailed his great death-stricken brother creeping slow around the corpse and uttering his lament o aeas mighty souled why was thine heart distraught that thou shouldst deal unto thyself murder and bell ah was it that the sons of troy might win a breathing space from woes might come and slay the greeks now thou art not for these shall all the old in courage fail when fast they fall in fight their shield from harm is broken now for me i have no will to see mine home again now thou art dead nay but i long here also now to die that so the earth may shroud me me and thee not for my parents so much do i care if haply yet they live if haply yet spared from the grave in salamis they dwell as for thee my glory and my crown so cried he groaning sore with answering moan queenly tecmessa wailed the princess bride of noble aeas captive of his spear yet tamed by him to wife and household queen o'er all his substance even all that wives won with a bride price rule for wedded lords clasped in his mighty arms she bare to him a son eurysaces in all things like unto his father as far as a babe might be yet cradled in his tent with bitter moan fell she on that dear corpse all her fair form close shrouded in her veil 
and dust defile and from her anguished heart cried piteously alas for me for me now thou art dead not by the hands of foes in fight struck down but by thine own on me is come a grief ever abiding never i had looked to see thy woeful death they here by troy ah visions shattered by rude hands of fate oh that the earth had yawned wide for my grave ere i beheld thy bitter doom on me no sharper more heart-piercing pang hath come no not when first from fatherland afar and parents thou didst bear me wailing sore mid other captives when the day of bondage had come on me a princess theretofore not for that dear lost home so much i grieve nor for my parents dead as now for thee for all thine heart was kindness unto me the hapless and thou madest me thy wife one soul with thee yea and the promise it is to throne me queen of fair towered salamis when home we won from troy the gods denied accomplishment thereof and thou hast passed into the unseen land thou hast forgot me and thy child who never shall make glad his father's heart shall never mount thy throne but him shall strangers make a wretched thrall for when the father is no more the babe is ward of meaner men a weary life the orphan knows and suffering cometh in every side upon him like a flood to me too thraldom's day shall doubtless come now thou hast died who wast my god on earth then in all kindness agamemnon spake princess no man on earth shall make thee thrall while tersa liveth yet while yet i live thou shalt have worship of us evermore and honour as a goddess with thy son as though yet living were that godlike man aeas who was the achaeans chiefest strength ah that he had not laid this load of grief on all in dying by his own right hand for all the countless armies of his foe never availed to slay him in fair fight so spake he grieved to the inmost heart the folk woefully wafted all round o'er hellespont echoes of mourning rolled the sighing air darkened around a wide-spread sorrow fall yea grief laid hold on wise odysseus self for the great dead and with remorseful soul to anguish-stricken argives thus he spake o friends there is no greater curse to men than wrath which groweth till its bitter fruit is strife now wrath hath goaded aeas on to this dire issue of rage that filled his soul against me would to god that ne'er yon trojans in the strife for achilles arms had crowned me with that victory for which strong telamon's brave son in agony of soul thus perished by his own right hand yet blame not me i pray you for his wrath blame the dark dolorous fate that struck him down for had mine heart foreboded aught of this this desperation of soul distraught never for victory had i striven with him nor had i suffered any danian else though ne'er so eager to contend with him nay i had taken up those arms divine with mine own hands and gladly given them to him i though himself desired it not but for such mighty grief and wrath in him i had not looked not since for a woman's sake nor for a city nor possessions wide i then contended but for honour's meed which always is for right-hearted men the happy goal of all their rivalry but that great-hearted man was led astray by fate the hateful fiend for surely it is unworthy a man to be made passion's fool the wise man's part is steadfast soul to endure all ills and not to rage against his lot so spake laertes son the far renowned but when they all were weary of grief and groan then to those sorrowing ones spake nilius son o oh, friends the pitiless-hearted fates have laid stroke after stroke of sorrow upon us 
sorrow for Aias dead, for mighty Achilles, for many an Argive, and for mine own son Antilochus. Yet all unmeet it is, day after day, with passion of grief to wail men slain in battle. Nay, we must forget laments, and turn us to the better task of rending dues beseeming to the dead, the dues of pyre, of tomb, of bones inured. No lamentations will awake the dead. No note thereof he taketh, when the fates, the ruthless ones, have swallowed him in night. So spake he words of cheer. The godlike kings gathered with heavy hearts around the dead, and many hands upheaved the giant corpse, and swiftly bare him to the ships, and there washed they away the blood that clotted lay dust-flecked on mighty limbs and armor. Then in linen swathed him round. From Ida's heights, wood without measure did young men bring, and piled it round the corpse. Billets and logs yet more in a wide circle heaped they round, and sheep they laid thereon, fair woven vest, and goodly kind, and speed triumphant steeds, and gleaming gold, an armor without stint from slain foes by that glorious hero stripped, and lucent amber drops they laid thereon, tears, they say, which the daughters of the sun, the lord of omens, shed for Phaethon slain, and by Eridanus flood they mourn for him. These for undying honour to his son the god made amber, precious in men's eyes. Even this the Argives on that broad-based pyre cast freely, honouring the mighty dead, and round him, groaning heavily, they laid silver most fair, and precious ivory, and jars of oil, and whatsoe'er beside they have who heap up goodly and glorious wealth. Then thrust they in the strength of the ravening flame, And from the sea there breathed a wind, Sent forth by Thetis, to consume the giant frame of Aeas. All the night and all the morn burned neath the urgent stress Of that great wind beside the ships that giant form, As when in Saladas by Zeus leaven was consumed Beneath the Renasia, when from all the isle smoke of his burning rose, or like as when Hercules, trapped by Nessus' deadly guile, gave to devouring fire his living limbs, what time he dared that awful deed, when groaned all Oeta as he burned alive, and passed his soul into the air, leaving the man far famous to be numbered with the gods, when earth closed o'er his toil-tried mortal part. So huge amid the flames, all armor-clad lay Aeas, all the joy of fight forgot, while a great multitude watching thronged the sands. Glad were the Trojans, but the Achaeans grieved. But when that goodly frame by ravening fire was all consumed, they quenched the pyre with wine. They gathered up the bones, and reverently laid in a golden casket. Hard beside Roetium's headland heaped they up a mound measureless high. Then scattered they amidst the long ships, heavy-hearted for the man whom they honoured, even as Achilles. Then black night, bearing unto all men sleep, upfloated, so they break bread, and lay down, waiting the child of the mist. Short was sleep, broken by fitful starting through the dark, haunted by dread, lest in the night the foe should fall on them, now Telamon's son was dead. End of chapter 5《Chapter 6 of the Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus Translated by Arthur S. Way Born 13 February 1847 Died 25 December 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rose dawn from ocean and Tithonus bed, and climbed the steeps of heaven, scattering round flushed flakes of splendor, laughed all earth and air. Then turned unto their labors, each to each, mortals, frail creatures daily dying. 
Then streamed to a folkmote all the Achaean men at Menelaus' summons. When the hosts were gathered all, then in their midst he spake, Hearken my word, ye god-descended kings. Mine heart within my breast is burdened sore for men which perish, men that for my sake came to bitter war, whose home return parents and home shall welcome nevermore, for fate hath cut off thousands in their prime. Oh, that the heavy hand of death had fallen on me, ere hitherward I gathered these. But now hath God laid on me cureless pain, in seeing all these ills, who could rejoice beholding strivings, struggles of despair? Come, let us, which yet be alive, in haste flee in the ships, each to his several land, since Aeas and Achilles both are dead. I look not, now they are slain, that we the rest shall scape destruction. Nay, we shall fall before yon terrible Trojans for my sake and shameless Helen's. Think not that I care for her, for you I care when I behold good men in battle slain. Away with her, her and her paltry paramour. The gods stole all discretion out of her false heart when she forsook mine home and marriage bed. Let Priam and the Trojans cherish her. But let us straight return. T'were better far to flee from dolorous war than perish all. So spake he, but to try the Argive men. Far other thoughts than these made his heart burn with passionate desire to slay his foes, to break the long walls of their city down from their foundations, and to glut with blood Ares when Paris mid the slain should fall. Fiercer is not than passionate desire. Thus he pondered, sitting in his place. Up rose Tydeus, shaker of the shield, and chode in fiery speech with Menelaus. O oh, coward Atreus' son, what craven fear hath gripped thee, that thou speakest so to us, as might a weakling child or woman speak? Not unto thee, Achaea's noblest sons, will hearken, ere Troy's coronal of towers be wholly dashed to the dust. For unto men valour is high renown, and flight is shame. If any man shall hearken to the words of this thy counsel, I will smite from him his head with sharp blue steel, and hurl it down for soaring kites to feast on. Up, all ye who care to enkindle men to battle, rouse our warriors all throughout the fleet to wet the spear, to burnish corslet, helm and shield, and cause both man and horse, all which be keen to fight, to break their fast. Then in yon plain, who is the stronger, Ares shall decide. So speaking, in his place he set him down. Then rose up Thestor's son, and in the midst, where meet it is to speak, stood forth and cried, Hear me, ye sons of battle-biding Greeks! Ye know I have the spirit of prophecy. Erewhile I said that ye, in the tenth year, should lay waste towered Ilium. This the gods are even now fulfilling. Victory lies at the Argives' very feet. Come, let us send Tydeus and Odysseus, battle-staunch, with speed to Skyros overseas. By prayers hither to bring Achilles' hero son, a light of victory shall he be to us. So spake wise Thestius' son, and all the folk shouted for joy, for all their hearts and hopes yearned to see Calchas' prophecy fulfilled. Then to the Argives spake Laertes' son, Friends, it befits not to say many words this day to you in sorrow's weariness. I know that wearied men can find no joy in speech or song, though the Pierides, the immortal muses, love it. At such time few words do men desire, but now this thing that pleaseth all the Achaean host I will accomplish, so Tydeus fare with me. For if we twain go, we shall surely bring, one by our words, War fain Achilles' son, yea, though his mother, weeping sore, should strive within her halls to keep him, for mine heart trusts that he is a hero's valorous son. Then spake out Menelaus earnestly, Odysseus, the strong Argives help at need, if mighty-souled Achilles' valiant son from Skyros by thy suasion come to aid us who yearn for him, and some heavenly one grant victory to our prayers, and I win home to Hellas. I will give to him to wife my noble child Hermione, 
with gifts many and goodly for her marriage dower with a glad heart i trow he shall not scorn either his bride or high-born sire-in-law with a great shout the daddians held his words then was the throng dispersed and to the ships they scattered hungering for the morning meat which strengtheneth man's heart so when they ceased from eating and desire was satisfied then with the wise odysseus tidius son drew down a swift ship to the boundless sea and victual and all tackling cast therein then stepped they abroad and with them twenty men men skilled to row when winds were contrary or when the unrippled sea slept neath a calm they smote the brine and flashed the boiling foam on leapt the ship a watery way was cleft about the oars that sweating rowers tugged as when hard toiling oxen neath the yoke straining drag on a massy timbered wain while creaks the circling axle neath its load and from their weary necks and shoulders streams down to the earth the sweat abundantly so at the stiff oars toiled those stalwart men and fast they laid behind them leagues of sea gazed after them the archaeans as they went then turned to wet their deadly darts and spears the weapons of their warfare in their town the aweless trojans armed themselves the while war eager praying to the gods to grant respite from slaughter breathing space from toil to these while sorely thus they yearned the gods brought present help in trouble even the seed of mighty hercules eurypylus a great host followed him in battle skilled all that by long Caiacus outflow dwelt full of triumphant trust in their strong spears round them rejoicing thronged the sons of troy as when tame geese within a pen gaze up on him who cast them corn and round his feet throng hissing uncouth love and his heart warms as he looks down on them so thronged the sons of troy as on fierce heart eurypylus they gazed and gladdened was his all his soul to see those throngs from porchways women looked wide-eyed with wonder on the godlike man above all men he towered as on he strode as looks a lion when amid the hills he comes on jackals paris welcomed him as hector honouring him his cousin he being of one blood with him who was born of astyoche king priam's sister fair whom telephus embraced in his strong arms telephus whom to all is hercules ague the bright-haired bear in secret love that babe a suckling craving for the breast a swift hind fostered giving him the teat as to her own fawn in all love for zeus so willed it in whose eyes it was not meet that hercules child should perish wretchedly his glorious son with glad heart paris led unto his palace through the wide wayed burg beside astaracus tomb and stately halls of hector and tritonus holy famed hard by his mansion stood and there beside a stainless altar to home water zeus rose as they went he lovingly questioned him of brethren parents and of marriage kin and all he craved to know eurypylus told so communed they on pacing side by side then came they to a palace great and rich there goddess-like said helen clothed upon with beauty of the graces maidens four about her plied their task others apart within that goodly bower wrought the works beseeming handmaids helen marvelling gazed upon eurypylus on helen he then these in converse each with other spake in that all odorous bower the handmaidens brought and set beside their lady high seats twain and paris set him down and at his side eurypylus that hero's host encamped without the city where the trojan guards kept watch their armour laid they on the earth their steeds yet breathing battle stood thereby and cribs were heaped with horses provender up floated night and darkened earth and air then feasted they before that cliff-like wall cetaean men and trojans babel of talk rose from the feasters all around the glow of blazing campfires lighted up the tents pealed out the pipe's sweet voice and hot boys rang their clear shrilling reeds the witching strain of lyres was rippling round from far away the argives gazed and marvelled seeing the plain aglare with many fires and hearing notes of flutes 
and lyres, neighing of chariot steeds, and pipes, the shepherds in the banquet's joy. Therefore they bade their fellows each in turn keep watch, and ward about the tents till dawn, lest those proud Trojans, feasting by their walls, should fall on them, and set the ships aflame. Within the halls of Paris all this while, with kings and princes Telephus' hero's son feasted, and Priam and the sons of Troy, each after each, prayed him to play the man against the Argives, and in bitter doom to lay them low, and blithe he promised all. So when they had supped, each hied him to his home, but there Eurypylus laid him down to rest full nigh the feast hall, in the stately bower where Paris theretofore himself had slept with Helen, world-renowned. A bower it was most wondrous fair, the goodliest of them all. There lay he down, but otherwhere their rest took they, till rose the bright throne queen of morn. Up sprang with dawn the son of Telephus, and passed to the host with all those kings in Troy abiding. Straightway did the folk, all battle-eager, don their warrior gear, burning to strike in forefront of the fight. And now Eurypylus clad his mighty limbs in armor that like leaven flashes gleamed. Upon his shield by cunning hands were wrought all the great labors of strong Hercules. Thereon were seen two serpents, flickering black tongues from grimly jaws. They seemed in act to dart, but Hercules' hands to right and left be the babe's hands were throttling them for all this was his spirit as zeus strength from the beginning was his strength the seed of heaven abiders never deedless is nor helpless but hath boundless powers yea even when in the womb unborn it lies nemea's mighty lion there was seen strangled by the strong arms of hercules his grim jaws dashed about with bloody foam he seemed in verity gasping out his life. Thereby was wrought the hydra, many-necked, flickering its dread tongues. Of its fearful head some severed lay on earth, but many more were budding from its necks, while Hercules and Iolus, dauntless hearty twain, toiled hard. The one with lightning sickle sweeps locked the fierce heads, his fellow seared each neck with glowing iron. The monster's soul was slain. Thereby was wrought the mighty tameless boar, with foaming jaws. Real seemed the pictured thing, as by Alcides' giant strength the brute was to Eurystheus living born on high. There fashioned was the fleet-foot stag, which laid the vineyard's waste of hapless husbandmen. The hero's hand held fast its golden horns, the while it snorted breath of ravening fire. Thereon were seen the fierce Stamphalian birds, some arrow-smitten dying in the dust, some through the grey air darting its swift flight. At this, at that one, hot in haste he seemed, Hercules sped the arrows of his wrath. A G.I.S. monstrous stable there was wrought with cunning craft on that invincible targ, and Hercules was turning through the same the deep flow of Alpheus stream divine, while wandering nymphs looked down on every hand upon that mighty work. Elsewhere portrayed was the fire-breathing bull, the hero's grip on his strong horns wrenched round the massive neck, the straining muscles on his arms stood out, the huge beast seemed to bellow. Next thereto, wrought on the shield, was one in beauty arrayed as a goddess, even Hippolyta. The hero by the hair was dragging her from her swift steed, with fierce resolve to wrest with his strong hands the girdle marvellous from the Amazon queen, while quailing shrank away the maids of war. There in the Thracian land were Diomedes' grim man-eating steeds. These at their gruesome mangers he had slain, and dead they lay with their fiend-hearted lord. There lay the bulk of giant Garion, dead mid his kine. His gory heads were cast in dust, dashed down by that resistless club. Before him slain lay that most murderous hound, Orthros, in furious might like Cerebus, his brother hound. A herdsman lay thereby, Eurytion, all bedabbled with his blood. And there were the golden apples wrought, 
that gleamed in the Hesperides' garden undefiled. All round the fearful serpent's deadly coil lay, and shrank the maids aghast from Zeus' bold son. And there, a dread sight even for gods to see, was Cerebus, whom the loathly worm had borne to Typho in a craggy cavern's gloom, close on the borders of eternal night. A hideous monster, warder of the gate of Hades, home of wailing, jailer hound of dead folk in the shadowy gulf of doom. But lately Zeus' son with his crashing blows tamed him, and hailed him from the cataract flood of Styx with heavy drooping head, and dragged the dog, sore loath to the strange upper air, all dauntlessly. And there, at the world's end, were Caucasus long glens, where Hercules, rending Prometheus' chains and hurling them this way and that, with fragments of the rock wherein too they were riveted, set free the mighty Titan. Arrow smitten lay the eagle of torment there beside. There stormed the wild rout of centaurs round the hall of Pholus, goaded on by strife and wine, with Hercules the monsters fought. Amidst the pine trunks stricken to death they lay, still grasping those strange weapons in dead hands, while some with stems long shafted still fought on in fury, and refrained not from the strife. And all their heads, gashed in the pitiless fight, were drenched with gore. The whole scene seemed to live. With blood the wine was mingled, meats and bowls and tables in one ruin shattered lay. There by even his torrent, in fierce wrath for his sweet bride, he laid with the arrow low, Nessus in mid-flight. There withal was wrought Antaeus' brawny strength, who challenged him to wrestling strife. He in those sinewy arms, raised high above the earth, was crushed to death. There, where the Hellespont meets the outer sea, lay the sea monster slain by his ruthless shafts, while from Hesonoe he rent her chains. A bold Alcides, many a deed beside, shone on the broad shield of Eurypylus. He seemed the war-god, as from rank to rank he sped. Rejoiced the Trojans following him, seeing his arms, and him clothed with the might of gods, and Paris hailed him to the fray. Glad am I for thy coming, for mine heart trusts that the Argives shall all wretchedly be with their ships destroyed. For such a man mid Greeks or Trojans never have I seen. Now by the strength and fury of Hercules, to whom in stature, might, and goodly head, most like thou art, I pray thee, have in mind him, and resolve to match his deeds with thine. Be the strong shield of Trojans hard bestead. Win us a breathing space. Thou only, I trow, from perishing Troy canst thrust the dark doom back. With kindling words he spake. That hero cried, Great-hearted Paris, like the blessed ones in goodly head. This lieth foreordained on the gods' knees, who in the fight shall fall and who outlive it. I, as honour bids, and as my strength sufficeth, will not flinch from Troy's defence. I swear to turn from fight never, except in victory or death. Gallantly he spake, with exceeding joy rejoiced the Trojans. Champions then he chose, Alexander and Aeneas, fiery-souled, Polydamus, Pemeon, and Ephibus, and Ithacus, of the Paphlagonian men, the staunchest man to stem the tide of war. These chose he, cunning in all battle-toil, to meet the foe in forefront of the fight. Swiftly they strode before that warrior throng, then from the city cheering charged. The host followed them in their thousands, as when bees follow with bands their leaders from the hives, with loud hum on a spring day, pouring forth, so to the fight the warriors followed these. As when a rushing mighty wind stirs up the barren sea-plain from its nethermost floor, and darkling to the strand roll roaring waves, belching sea tangled from the bursting surf, and wild sounds rise from beaches harvestless, so as they charged, the wide earth rang again. Now from their rampart forth the Argives poured round godlike Agamemnon, rang their shouts, cheering each other on to face the fight, and not to cower beside the ships in dread of onset shouts of battle-eager foes. They met those charging hosts with hearts as light as calves bear, 
when they leap to meet the kind down faring from hill pastures in the spring unto the steading when the fields are green with corn blades when the earth is glad with flowers and bowls are brimmed with milk of kine and ewes and multitudinous lowing far and near uprises as the mothers meet their young and in their midst the herdsmen joys so great was the uproar that rose when met the fronts of battle dread it rang on either hand hard strained was then the fight incarnate strife stalked through the midst with slaughter ghastly faced crashed bullhide shields and spears and helmet crest meeting the brass flashed out like leaping flames bristled the battle with lances earth ran red with blood as slaughtered heroes fell and horses mid a tangle of shattered cars yet some with spear wounds gasping while on them others were falling through the air up shrieked an awful indistinguishable roar for on both hosts fell iron-hearted strife here were men hurling cruel jagged stones there speeding arrows and new-wetted darts there with an axe or tribill hewing hard slashing with swords and thrusting out with spears their mad hands clutched all manner of tools of death at first the argives bore the ranks of troy backward a little but they rallied charged leapt on the foe and drenched the field with blood like a black hurricane rushed eurypylus cheering his men on hewing argives down awlessly measureless might was led to him by zeus for a grace to glorious hercules Nereus, a man in beauty like the gods his spear long shafted stabbed beneath the ribs down on the plain he fell forth streamed the blood drenching his splendid arms drenching the form glorious of mould and his thick clustered hair there mid the slain in dust and blood he lay like a young lusty olive sapling which a river rushing down in roaring flood carrying its banks away and cleaving wide a chasm channel hath this rooted lo it lieth heavy blossomed so lay then the goodly form the grace of loveliness of nereus on earth's breast but o'er the slain loud rang the taunting of eurypylus lie in the dust thy beauty marvellous naught hath availed thee i have plucked thee away from life to which thou wast so fain to cling rash fool who didst defy a mightier man unknowing beauty is no match for strength he spake and leapt upon the slain to strip his goodly arms but now against him came machaeon wroth for nereus by his side doom overtaken with his spear he drave at his right shoulder strong albeit he was he touched him and blood spurted from the gash yet ere he might leap back from gravel of death even as a lion or fierce mountain boar maddens mid thronging huntsmen furious fain to rend the man whose hand first wounded him so fierce eurypylus on machaeon rushed the long lance shot out swiftly and pierced him through on the right haunch yet would he not give back nor flinch from the onset fast though flowed the blood in haste he snatched a huge stone from the ground and dashed it on the head of telephus son but his helm warded him from death or harm then waxed eurypylus more hotly wroth with that strong warrior and in fury of soul clear through machaeon's breast he drave his spear and through the midriff past the gory point he fell as falls beneath the lion's jaw a bull and round him clasped his glancing arms swiftly eurypylus plucked the lance of death out of the wound and vaunting cried aloud wretch wisdom was not bound in thine heart that thou a weakling didst come forth to fight a mightier therefore art thou in the toils of doom much profit shall be thine when kites devour the flesh of thee in battle slain ta dost thou hope still to return to scape mine hands a leech art thou and soothing salves thou knowest and by these didst haply hope to flee the evil day not thine own sire on the wind's wings descending from olympus should save thy life not though between thy lips he should pour nectar and ambrosia faint breathing answered him the dying man eurypylus thine own weird is to live not long fate is at point to meet thee here on troy's plain and to still thy impious tongue so passed his spirit into hades hall then to the dead man spake his conqueror 
Now on earth lie thou. What shall betide hereafter, I care not. Yea, though this day death doom stand by my feet, no man may live for ever. Each man's fate is foreordained. Stabbing the corpse he spake. Then shouted loud Terser at seeing Machaon in the dust. Far thence he stood, hard toiling in the fight, for on the centre sore the battle lay. Foe after foe pressed on. Yet not for this was Terser heedless of the fallen grave, neither of Nereus lying hard thereby behind Machaon in the dust. He saw, and with a great voice raised the rescue cry. Charge, Argives! Flinch not from the charging foe, for shame unspeakable shall cover us if Trojan men held back to Ilium, noble Machaon, and Nereus godlike fair. Come, with a good heart let us face the foe to rescue these slain friends, or fall ourselves beside them. Duty bids that men defend friends, and to aliens leave them not a prey. Not without sweat of toil is glory won. Then were the Danians anguish stung. The earth round them tied they red with blood of slain, as foe fought foe in even balanced fight. By this to Polydarius tidings came, how that in dust his brother lay, struck down by woeful death. Beside the ships he sat, ministering to the hurts of men with spears stricken. In wrath for his brother's sake he rose, he clad him in his armour, in his breast dread battle prowess swelled. For conflict grim he panted, boil the maddened blood round his heart. He leapt amidst the foemen, his swift hand swung the snake-headed javelin up, and hurled and slew with its winged speed Agamestor's son Clytius. A bright-haired nymph had given him birth beside Parthenius, whose quiet stream fleets smooth as oil through green lands, till it pours its shining ripples to the Oxine sea. Then by his warrior brother laid he Lolassus, whom Pronoe, fair as a goddess, bare beside Nymphaeus' stream, hard by a cave, a wide and wondrous cave. Sacred it is, men say, unto the nymphs, even all that haunt the long reach Paphlagonian hills, and all that by full clustered Heracleia dwell. That cave is like the work of gods, of stone in manner marvellous moulded. Through it flows cold water, crystal clear. In niches round stand bowls of stone upon the rugged rock, seeming as though they were wrought by carver's hands. Statues of wood gods stand around, fair nymphs, looms, distaffs, all such things as mortal craft fashioneth. Hundreds seem they unto men which pass into that hollowed cave. It hath, up leading and down leading, doorways twain, facing the one the wild north wind's shrilling blast and one the dank rain-burdened south. By this do mortals pass beneath the nymphs' wide caves. But that is the immortal's path. No man may tread it, for a chasm, deep and wide, down-reaching unto Hades, yawns between. This tract the blessed gods alone may behold. So died a host on either side that warred over Machaon and Goliath's son. But at the last, through desperate wrestle of fight, the Danians rescued them. Yet few were they which bare them to the ships. By bitter stress of conflict were the more part compassed round, and needs must still abide the battle's brunt. But when full many had filled up the measure of fate, mid tumult, blood and agony, then to their ships did many Argives flee, pressed by Eurypolis hard, an avalanche of havoc. Yet few abode the strife round Aeas and the Atreidae, rallying. Haply these had perished all, beset by throngs on throngs of foes on every hand, had not only a son stabbed with his spear twixt shoulder and breast, or wise Polydamus. Forth gushed the blood, and he recoiled a space. Then Menelaus pierced the Ephibus by the right breast, that with swift feet he fled, and many of that slaughter-breathing throng were slain by Agamemnon. Furiously he rushed on god like Ithacus with the spear, but he shrank from the forefront back mid friends. Now when Eurypolis the battle stay marked how the ranks of Troy gave back from fight, he turned him from the host that he had chased even to the ships, and rushed with eagle swoop on Atreus' strong sons and Oleus' seed, stout-hearted, who was passing fleet of foot, and in fight peerless. Swiftly he charged on these, grasping his spear long-shafted. At Iris' side charged Paris, 
charged Aeneas stout of heart, who hurled a stone exceeding huge that crashed on Aeas' helm, dashed to the dust he was, yet gave not up the ghost, whose day of doom was fate ordained amidst the cafarious rocks on the voyage home. Now his valiant men out of the foe's hand snatched him, bare him thence, scarce drawing breath, to the Achaean ships. And now the Atriad kings, war-renowned, were left alone, and murder-breathing foes encompassed them, and hurled from every side, whate'er their hands might find. The deadly shafts some showered, some the stone, the javelin some. They in the midst eye turned this way and that, as boars or lions compassed round with pales on that day when kings gathered to the sport the people, and to pen the mighty beast within the toils of death. But these, although the walls ring round, yet tear with tusk and fang what luckless thrall soever draweth near. So these death-compassed heroes slew their foes, ever they pressed on. Yet had their might availed not for defence for all their will, had Tercer and Idomeneus strong of heart not come to help, with Thoas, Meriones, and godlike Thrasymedes. They which shrank erewhile before Eurypylus, yea, had fled unto the ships to scape the crushing doom. But that, in fear for Atreus' sons, they rallied against Eurypylus, deadly waxed the fight. Then Tercer, with a mighty spear thrust, smote Aeneas' shield, yet wounded not his flesh, for the great fourfold buckler warded him, yet feared he, and recoiled a little space. Let Meriones on Laophoan, the son of Paeon, born on Axis' flood of bright-haired Cleomede, unto Troy with noble Asteropeus had he come to aid her folk. Him Meriones' keen spear stabbed neath the navel, and the lance head tore his bowels forth, swift sped his soul away into the shadow land. Alcimedes, the warrior friend of Aeas, only a son, shot mid the press of Trojans, for he sped with taunting shout a sharp stone from a sling into their battle's heart. They quelled in fear before the hum and onrush of the bolt. Fate winged its flight to the bold charioteer of Pamion, Hippasa's son, his brow with smote while yet he grasped the reins, and flung him stunned down from the chariot seat before the wheels. The rushing war wain whirled his wretched form twixt tires and heels of onward leaping steeds, and awful death in that hour swallowed him, when whips and reins had flown from his nerveless hands. Then grief thrilled Pamion. Hard necessity made him both chariot lord and charioteer. Now to his doom and death they had he bowed, had that a Trojan through that gory strife leapt, grasped the reins, and saved the prince, when now his strength failed neath the murderous hands of foes. As godlike Achamus charged, the stalwart son of Nestor thrust the spear above his knee, and with that wound sore anguish came on him. Back from the fight he drew, the deadly strife he left unto his comrades. Quenched now was his battle lust. Eurypylus' henchman smote a Chemion Thoas friend amidst the fray, beneath the shoulder. Nigh his heart the spear passed bitter biting, or his limbs break out mingled with blood, cold sweat of agony. He turned to flee. Eurypylus' giant might chased caught him, cheering his heel tendons through. There where the blow fell, his reluctant feet stayed, and the spirit left his mortal frame. Thoas pricked Paris with a quick thrusting spear on the right thigh. Backward a space he ran for his death-speeding bow, which had been left to rearward of the fight. Idomeneus upheaved the stone, huge as his hands could swing, and dashed it on Eurypylus' arm. To earth fell his death-dealing spear. Backward he stepped to grasp another, since from out his hand the first was smitten. So had Atreus' sons a moment-breathing space from stress of war. But swiftly drew Eurypylus' henchmen near, bearing a stubborn shafted lance, wherewith he brake the strength of many. In stormy night then charged he on the foe, whom so he met he slew, and spread wide habit through their ranks. Now neither Atreus' sons might steadfast stand, nor any valiant Danian beside, for ruinous panic suddenly gripped the hearts of all. For on them all Eurypylus rushed, flashing death in their faces, chased them, slew, cried to the Trojans and to his chariot lords, Friends, be of good heart. To these Danians let us deal slaughter and doom's darkness now. Lo, oh, how like scared sheep back to the ships they flee. Forget not your death-dealing battle lore, O ye that from your youth are men of war. Then charged they on the Argives as one man, and these in utter panic turned and fled the bitter battle. 
those hard after them followed as white-fanged hounds hold deer in chase up the long forest glens full many in dust dashed they down howsoe'er they long to escape the slaughter grim and great of that wild fray eurypylus had slain bucolion nessus and chromion and atrophus twain in mycenae dwelt a goodly land in lacedaemon twain men of renown albeit they were he slew them then he smote a host unnumbered by the common throng my strength should not suffice to sing their fate how fain soe'er though within my breast were iron lungs aeneas slew with all atimachus and Pyrrhus, twain which left crete with idomeneus Agenor smote molius the princely with king stentilus he came from argos hurled from far behind a dart new wetted as he fled from fight piercing his right leg and the eager shaft cut sheer through the broad sinew shattering the bones with anguished pain and so his doom met him to die a death of agony then paris arrows laid focus low and mosinus brethren both from salamis who came in aeas ships and never more saw the homeland cleolus smote he next mega's stout henchman for the arrow struck his left breast deadly night enwrapped him round and his soul fleeted forth his fainting heart still in his breast fluttering convulsively made the winged arrow shiver yet again did paris shoot at bold etion through his jaw leapt the sudden flashing brass he groaned and with his blood were mingled tears so ever man slew man till all the space was heaped with argives each on other cast now had the trojans burnt with fire the ships had not night trailing heavy folded mist uprisen so eurypylus drew back and troy's sons with him from the ships aloof a little space by samoa's outfall there camped they exultant but amid the ships flung down upon the sands the argives wailed heart anguish for the slain so many of whom dark fate had overtaken and laid in dust End of chapter six